In this episode, we get down and dirty. <laughs> with five ultimate off-road rides that dare to defy the limits of their terrain. It's fully amphibious. It can get you pretty much anywhere. We take to the water. People can't believe what they're seeing. Race across the desert. It's a 40-year-old car that's not originally designed to drive on this terrain. <laughs> so good. Oh, man. And push these vehicles to the absolute limit. This thing drives like a tank. When you're struggling to cross terrain, it will get you where you want to go. When you're operating off-road, nothing stands in your way. miles of desert to race across and less than a day to do it you need an ultimate ride what would you choose wait what whoa that's insane i love driving this thing it's amazing you get in the car you think it's a really old bug and then suddenly it just comes to life it's roaring it's fast i mean it's just incredible driving this car in the baja 1000 can be summed up for me in one word exhausting. You are out in the middle of nowhere and there's a constant barrage of input and stimulus. <laughs> so good. Just so good. This is Tope, the Baja Buggy. This custom VW off-road Beetle was built for one of the toughest races in the world. The Baja 1000 is the longest point-to-point off-road race in the world that's run in a single day. And we decided to race it because we just really like a challenge. The Beetle's perfect for this race because of the preparation that goes into it. The car is very well prepared. It's able to get through a lot of the really difficult terrain that takes out other vehicles. The VW Beetle has more wins at the Baja 1000 than any other ride. This is one of the most grueling and demanding races on the planet. Josh and his team have built an absolute animal. This 1970 Class 11 may look pretty standard, but under the shell, Tope is built to be brutal. I wanted to be a part of this project because it's always been a dream of mine to race the Baja 1000. A good ride is only as good as its team. And in 2017, I was part of the chase group. I think Tope is an ultimate ride because every single component on it was purpose-built by the team to race the Baja 1000. My role on the team is co-driver, graphic designer, art director, and webmaster. I wanted to be involved with this project because it seemed like one of the greatest adventures a person could have. You could be doing anything on any given day. One day, you could be fabricating a mount for the traction boards, and another day, you could be wiring up the communications. So, what does it take to build a Baja buggy? We started with the stock Volkswagen motor. We lifted the suspension using all stock components, put a fuel cell, breathing, new shocks, a GPS, a radio, and all new lighting so you can see in the night. It's a very stock looking car on the outside, but there's a few features that give it away, like these big beefy skid plates and these really bright lights. And in addition to that, the Volkswagen logo is blessed by the Pope. Blessed by the Pope? Holy horsepower! You've got yourself an ass-kicking ride. This might not be the fastest car, but it sure is capable. It'll go up nearly anything you point it at. One of the interesting things about racing Baja is that it's not just the race car that's going down the course. There's a lot of people that have to bring fuel and tools along the course because it's very remote. Think this bug is badass on the outside? Check this out. When you get into the interior of the car, you get into the GPS and the radio. You've got an intercom, and you've got air that pumps into your helmet so you can breathe in the dust. The custom dash gives you all types of information from gauges and switches. You can turn on each light individually. 
and all of the things that makes it so that you can continue on in the race. It's hard to put a price tag on a vehicle like this. Every time you come back from a race, you're constantly rebuilding and replacing everything. So it's really just throwing money out the window. It feels great to be sitting in the car again. Every time I drive this thing, I'm always amazed at how capable it is. The disadvantages of driving this car is driving this car. It's a 40-year-old car that's mostly stock. It is not originally designed to drive on this terrain, so everything has its limitations. The suspension, the brakes, the power, everything. It's quite a bit of fun to drive. So good, just so good. Oh, man. Every time we race this car, we learn something new. So the next step for this thing is to continue to develop it and make it better so that we can race it in Baja 1000. Man, I think you and Tope will be more than ready to take the Baja by storm. From Desert Beetle to Rural Rat Rock. Ah, the sleepy wilderness of Canada. Home to one of the wildest rat rods you'll ever lay eyes on. This incredible Warper World War II build goes by the name of Tankenstein. And the creator of this amazing mechanical mashup is Sean Camier. I guess I could still say Tankenstein is the world's only rat rod tank. Right up till someone says, hey, no, I have another one. Tankenstein is a mixture of old car parts, kind of like Frankenstein, where they took the different body parts. Well, this is the same thing. She's a compilation of parts stuck together and made to work. After five years of mixing and mashing machinery, the Tankenstein is one truly terrifying ride. Sean slammed together anything he could find, creating this bizarre beast from a real blend of rides. This transformed tow truck is a clever piece of engineering, a radical rat rod that can tackle any terrain. So this is Tankenstein, a World War II burn gun carrier chassis. And what we have here is a 47 Mercury tow truck cab. We've thrown them all together into Tankenstein. She's got bullet holes all over the place. These are 22 holes here, and it's got a shotgun slug to the door over there. For now, Tankenstein's powered by a 305. It's got roughly 175 horsepower. She'll do about 45, 50 mile an hour top end. Who needs air conditioning or windows when you have like original glass? This is original glass from 47. Everybody tells me I should take it out because it could get cut, but no, I think it adds character to it. I don't use any blueprints or drawings. It's all done by eye. Like life, plans change all the time, so why bother making plans? Just go with the flow. I try to use recycled parts, but it still costs you money to buy it. If you're blasting this beast through the mud, you might as well look the part. So when you drive Tankenstein, you have to be in character, so that's why you get the helmet and uh, Thompson. Good thing it's not a real one. I'd be crying right now. It's full of mud. Tankenstein ain't hitting retirement anytime soon. This soldier has a few more years of service yet. I'm working on this stuff just for the fun of it. It's never going to be done. I keep adding things to it and changing things. I think it's been five or six years now since I started Tankenstein. And always be adding a little bit more to it. And I've been offered a lot of money for it before, but if I sell it, what do I have after that? I'll have a bunch of money. What good's that? From terrifying tank to army animal. Parked in the picturesque Oakland County, this next ride is a spacious van built to carry cargo and about to be destroyed by the colonel. Brother, that's got to hurt. At home on land or sea, 
ready for the battlefield or a trip to the mall. The Colonel is one crazy ride. I'm the only person that can say I own a privately owned amphibious combat vehicle. The building process on the vehicles started in 2000. The truck was manufactured by a company called General Purpose Vehicles. They made roughly about 11 vehicles. It took them close to three years in construction. Some friends of mine who came to me and said, let's buy a armored vehicle. And I said, let's do it. And we've been basically trying to put it out in the movie industry and TVs, and we've done quite a few events. Some of the movies the vehicle's been in have been Red Dawn. It was recently in a Fox movie, which I'm not yet allowed to disclose. Oh, at least tell us how much it costs. I don't like to discuss what we paid for it because there was other things that we had to do to the vehicle to ensure safety. And the Colonel has the stats to back up that formidable look. This weapon of a vehicle is an off-road animal. The Caterpillar C7 six-cylinder diesel engine is fed by three massive fuel tanks, which give the Colonel a range of over 900 miles. Yes, it will protect you in a military attack, but it doesn't skip the modern features, heating, air conditioning, and onboard cameras. The motor is located in the center of the vehicle, and that has a lot of huge advantages, such as reducing its infrared signature, allowing for more cooling from the air conditioning system to cool it. It has the blinkers, it has the headlights, it has high beams, it has extra fog lights. These things up here are bullet deflectors. You're taking a high impact round. It's going to shred the round as it hits. We have eight massive tires, and we have the ability to engage a diff lock, which means all eight wheels are spinning at the same time. So when we go into mud, this thing drives like a tank. And this baby might be built to deflect bullets, but you can also pack in the people. There's seating for 10 in the rear, and then we have additional seating of four in the front. Go to another country and you drive on the other side of the road, you can actually literally just smooth everything over and now you're driving on the other side. You can see the armor thickness, it's pretty well protected. It's actually a very fun vehicle to drive. It will push through almost anything. Its front end was designed to go through one foot thick concrete walls. With no unwanted brick walls around, this van was just asking for trouble. And here it comes. It can drive over telephone poles, and you don't even spill your cup of coffee. Oh, that is savage. This beast can deflect an anti-tank mine, so that pesky van stood no chance. There's no place to hide when the Colonel rolls out, not even in the sea. This thing is amphibious. It floats. We have pumps here. We have pumps in the APU compartment, pumps in the center, and pumps in the engine compartment, and pumps in the front. Everyone must be pumped about the Colonel. As far as my friends, family, they thought it was a crazy purchase. I would love to acquire more of the vehicles, but I'd like to also see the vehicles actually be rented more in the movie industry. We all agreed we will never sell the vehicle. Rent it? Buy it? Brother, I gotta build me one of these. From total destruction to smooth sailing. Across the pond in the UK, you'd never think this next car would go off-road. But boy, would you be wrong. This is a ride that'll make your heart melt. Hi, I'm Kerry Cheese, and this is my 1964 Amphicar. Come on, brother, let's keep it mature. The attraction of having an amphibious car is the fact that you can just drive it down the road, come up to the local river, into the slipway, and straight in and sail down the river. This ain't no makeshift mod. Kerry bought this river ride in an online auction, shipping it over and giving it a hearty makeover. The whole project cost a cool 38,000 bucks. Love for amphibious cars is bigger than you might think. 
Every year, thousands of enthusiasts meet up in Europe to appreciate these unique rides. You gotta love this little ride. It drives and sails with style for every mile. It is an everyday car on the road. From inside, you wouldn't even know you was in a boat. It is very comfortable. It's quite easy to drive. You've got to remember everything, just take a bit slower. You're not rushing through the gears. I have had it to 70, but cruising 65 is usually OK. The brakes are only as good as the effort you put into them. You're back in the 60s with their technology. It's a great feeling. Roof down, nice days, it's brilliant. Sounds beautiful, Kerry. Now let's hit the river. Uh, basically, it's a car that you drive down the road. The fun part comes when you come to the water, drive in, engage the prop shafts at the back, and then off you go down the river. The only main things you have to do, there's a second lock on the doors, and it's just pull them up, otherwise the water comes pouring in. Do not forget that. I've forgotten it once. The water does come in, but luckily it wasn't too fast. Oh, Kerry. There's only one thing left for it now. Let's take it in the water. Man, I hope she floats. Oh, no. I've got that sinking feeling. Brother, you had me worried. It's easy, relaxing. It's one of the best feelings you could ever have. The people in boats all wave to you. They all smile. Everyone takes photos, smiling and waving. Everyone seems to recognise that it's a car and can't believe what they're seeing. The one thing you do have to remember is that you can't use your brake pedal on water. It operates the lights and stops the wheels spinning in the water, but that's all it'll do. Duly noted. That's great. It just makes a great day out. From a nautical novelty to awesome ATV. Are you looking for a ride that can go anywhere? Through swamps, across frozen lakes, crushing through forests. If you want nothing to stand in your way, boy, have I found the ultimate ATV. This badass off-road animal is the shirt. It was made for really, really remote areas and tough terrains. And this baby isn't just at home on land. The Sherp can cross swamps, water, it's fully amphibious. Brother, that is insane. Any type of weather, it can get you pretty much anywhere. With the Sherp, obstacles don't block the path, they are the path. This all-terrain vehicle is a one of a kind, covering the toughest terrains without breaking a sweat. It can roll over obstacles up to three feet high and up a gradient of 35 degrees. And with over 20 years of build experience, the Sherp guys have turned out an absolute beast. The main thing about the Sherp is the tires. The tires are self-inflated with the exhaust, which allows you to control the pressure. And you can deflate and inflate it within the 30 to 40 seconds, all the way down and all the way up. That is one neat tire trick. Depends on what kind of terrain you want to cross. If you want to inflate the tires with the exhaust, you just close the valve, hit the right button, use the gas, and uh, the exhaust going right into the tires, all four wheels even. In each tire, you got the additional fuel tank. It could fit up to 55 liters per one tire. So in total, it gives you around 280, 285 liters, the whole unit, including the main tank. If you fill up, it allows you to go 3,000 kilometers. That's some serious gas. And this little baby is roomier than you think. So it could fit up to four people in the back with comfort. But uh, in some emergency situations, uh, it could fit up to eight. Here you got uh, steering levers, turn left, turn right, five gear, manual transmission, the roof hatch. We have a recreational market for sure. 
These guys ain't playing. The Sherpa will demolish any terrain. This is one sweet ride. The idea comes from uh, Russia. In 2012, that was a prototype. After that, they started the mass production in 2015. Since 2017, we sold over 200 units in North America, and uh, we have six dealers in Canada so far and 15 in the U.S. The Sherp is built in Ukraine, and we assemble it here in Canada. Brother, I'm sold. How much am I writing a check for? Our standard version of Sherp is 107,000 U.S. dollars. If you want to ride literally anywhere, you got to pay the big bucks. The very favorite thing about the Sherp is the tires. I love the tires. We've been in uh, situations where we thought, this is it, this is over. This is where we cannot cross. But the Sherp has never got stuck. When you're struggling to cross this particular terrain, the Sherp will get you where you want to go. The ride that can take you anywhere and never lets you down. That's what I'm talking about. True off-road vehicles are not meant to obey the rules. Breaking the rules, that's what I'm all about. We'll see you next time on Ultimate Ride.